Okay, so um, we have time for some questions. We have some time for some questions. So um, here's one right here. Hi, Tim. Thanks for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, my name's Janet, and I'm with the Ecology Action Center. We're a provincial organization. We do work on um, all kinds of issues. One of our uh, one seventh of the work we do is sustainable transportation, both in Halifax and across the province. And um, active transportation is a big part of that. And we've noticed, um, uh, many people have noticed in the last couple of months, in uh, mainly Halifax, but outside of HRM as well, that uh, pedestrian injuries and deaths have come spiked. And um, there's going to be, for folks who don't know, uh, the council is going to look at that. Uh, there's a motion to examine that issue in more depth uh, next week at HRM Council. I'm just wondering what um, your experience is in addressing the pedestrian safety issues. I know a lot of people see that you know walking as the four-second cousin in the active transportation mix. It's walking, you know, sidewalks. It's as simple as that. If it were as simple as that, we wouldn't be seeing the, the injuries and the deaths. So, so what what can HRN do? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a whole other presentation on pedestrian safety because we've just been working on it for the last year and a half. We had um, a series of, of very uh, frequent pedestrian uh, collisions at one point, and our mayor set a directive to all of the, the department heads in the city to basically figure it out. And he set a goal of 25% reduction of pedestrian fatalities and collisions by 2017, and 50% by 2021. And he wanted two things. He wanted uh, early action measures, so what are the things we can do right now, and then what is the strategic plan to actually get us to those reductions with a concrete work plan. And he put, uh, put my agency and the Department of Public Health together, so we had the Transportation Agency and the Public Health Department working as co-chairs of a task force to really solve this issue. And <clears throat> We had the mayor's office on our back every single month. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And we really was baffled by this. Like, no one was in charge of pedestrian safety. Who is in charge of pedestrian safety? Is it MTA? Is it public health? Who is it? So we basically, what we did is we developed, we organized this uh, very targeted task force, got it together and said, what's the issue going on? Because uh, a lot of it is to do with the design of the streets. You know, so we, we found that there's four key areas. One is the design of the streets. The streets are designed to move the cars too fast for these areas where there's pedestrians uh, crossing a lot. Two, pedestrians are incredibly distracted right now. They're always on their headphones, texting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People are not, we call it bumping, where there's two people texting in San Francisco and they're literally bumping to each other and look at each other and go, and just keep walking. So, you know, we have that situation. So we found in our collision that 40% of the collisions were people actually um, getting hit by cars because the cars were distracted or they were, they were crossing in when, they were the, when the person was legally able to cross, 40% of the time they were being hit by a car illegally. So the car shouldn't have done that. The other 40% the pedestrians completely distracted, like running across the street or sometimes they just jump out of the sky, I don't know where they come from, they just jump out of the sky and then that happens. So we said, okay, so both are at fault. People in cars, people walking are at fault. So the issue is speed, but just slow it down. So we, we're trying to slow things down. I had a graph um, that I'm, I didn't show in this presentation, but we did an analysis and found that if you're moving at 40 miles per hour, which is 60, I think, 60 or 70 miles an hour, there is an 80% chance you'll be killed on impact. If you're traveling at 30 kilometers an hour, there is an 80% chance you'll survive the impact. So we have to slow down our streets. And we just can't put signs everywhere because it's nice to put a sign it's engineering the streets down. If I'm a person in a car, and I see a 40 km per hour sign, and there's no one around, but the street's designed for 75 kilometers an hour, I'm gonna go 75. But if I've designed a street that there's no way I can go more than 40 kilometers an hour, that's how fast I'm gonna go. So engineering is really important. Enforcement, we, uh, we have a police section in our agency that's part of the traffic for police, but we're not really knowing what they're doing half the time in terms of are you actually targeting enforcement in these areas? What's the, what's the police's role in this? And they're really struggling with, with, the, with their resources. So we developed these high injury corridors. We looked at the collision and did a map and said, here are the, out of the 1,000 kilometers of streets, here are the 50 kilometers of streets that have the highest injuries. And here they are by police district. So now we've actually shown the police 
these are the five corners of streets in your district that we really need you to constantly focus on. And we're starting to see this reversal now where people are physically seeing the policemen out there, they're noticing that they're out there, and we're also looking at ways to um, have more enforcement of those, those, those high injury corridors. And the last thing really is the education piece. Um, you're right, it's like, it's like a poor cousin of the active transportation movement, because everyone kind of doesn't realise that walking is actually a mode, they kind of didn't think about it. It's like, why would I think about it? I'm a bicyclist, I'm a transit rider, I'm a motorist. So we're trying to show that walking is actually really good. It's a really good way to improve your public health, it's great to reduce your cholesterol, all these different things. So we're partnering with the public health agencies to really encourage people to walk more. And so I think they're the three, four things that we're working on um, very, very closely. The, the infrastructure piece, though, is, is really the, one of the key tools, and it's unfortunately the most expensive. So understanding um, paint, stop signs, and other things you can do temporarily to slow cars down, that's really what I would suggest um, as, as, as a really cool tool. So it was a long-winded answer to your question, but I hope it helped. Question here. Hi, uh, my name is Ashley. You live in San Francisco, which is mostly full of people who are, are, or there's a lot of people there who are kind of a bit non traditional as the reputation it has. We've also lived in Los Angeles where, uh, you know, car is king. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I see here is that there's a heck of a lot of people who would find it really, really weird to have someone in public policy say it is a goal of the city to have you not own a car. Right, to actually say, I want people to choose never to buy a car, to have that as a public policy. That's something that, that advocates and environmentalists say. That's not something the government would ever say. Right? Um, and I'm wondering how, how do you think that places, because you can see the transition, I feel like it's starting even in a place like Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Um, how, how do you get there from here? Right? How, how do you make that into an acceptable public policy to say we actually want, because when, when it becomes more difficult to drive here, I often hear people want the government to make it easier to drive, right? Yeah. If, if you're slowing your cars down too much because there's congestion, then you need to make the roads wider. Or if gas is too expensive, then you need to stop taxing as much. Yeah. That sort of thing, as opposed to when it becomes difficult, treating that as actually a valid policy method to get people out of cars. Yeah. How, how do you change that conversation? How do you get there from here? Well, I think it's a, that's my last word, right? That's, that's what we're going to be doing here. Um, it's how you frame the message. You know, one thing that government is really not good at, no, I won't say bad, we're not really not good at, is messaging. We don't know how to, how to message these things because none of us took marketing and probably should have. All public policy and planning students should learn marketing. Um, but we're very fortunate that we've been really focusing on this is what we want to do better versus this is what we're gonna, we don't want to do. Like we don't publicly say, we want you all to get out of your cars. Cars are bad, you're evil, because they're not. You know, they're actually, it's a, it's a valuable piece of our transportation system. What we want to do, though, is create opportunities where you don't have to drive, because you don't want to. And I know, I hear those same arguments all the time in San Francisco saying, you know, why are you making it worse for cars? You know, we're paying our taxes, we're paying our dollars, we're the ones who make the economy work, blah, 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 it goes on, on, on. And I say to them, well, because two things. We are rapidly aging. We're going to have the highest growth rate now in our demographic is over 65 in the next 20 years. And most of the people that we speak with say, I don't want to be able to drive when I'm 80, and I'm actually scared to. So I don't want this as an option. I want something else. But I'm also afraid because I don't want to give up my, my freedom, or my, my mobility. The same thing with the younger uh, demographic. They don't necessarily want to own a car. They think driving is cool, but they don't really need to own the car. So it's already heading that way, whether I like it or not. We reframe the argument of our economy will not flourish if we keep this kind of system in place. It's too expensive for us to operate and maintain. We made some very bold, visionary moves in the 50s to have a national freeway network, and we put a lot of parking in the downtown, and we did a lot of things to make the roads wider, and we ripped up all the streets, cut system, et cetera. That was a very clear vision. It was a mistake. And it's time for us to own up and say it was a mistake. And the different opportunity for us now is how do we create that integrated system where you can choose to bicycle, walk, take transit, taxi, car share, or drive yourself as equal choices uh, from point A to point B. And in that regard, it requires a different land use element as well. We can't all live in single family houses. 
spread from here to Vancouver. It's not going to work because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So there's going to be this process of consolidation and different choices. And so reframing the discussion of how do we get more transportation choices so that we can actually free up the space. In Los Angeles, I, we see this argument all the time because we're building a big transit network and really densifying the city. And we you know heard people saying, you know, there's no way you're going to get me out of my Mercedes Benz. I've worked so hard to be driving in the Mercedes Benz and you have no idea what you're going to do to me. I said, I don't want you to go to your car. I want everybody else around you to go to your car so I can make that freeway better for you. <laughs> right? <laughs> so if you vote, if you vote for this transit expenditure, people are going to get off the freeway and give you more space because you deserve it, right? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, go transit. You know, so, but if you had the conversation of, I want you out of your car, you're going to kill the project. So you've got to, how you frame it is the discussion. So being clever about it is my point. Okay, we have more, uh, lots more questions and uh, it's going to be difficult to get them all in, but, um, and just Dave here with your um, tag, if you don't have a piece of paper that says your name on it, we're going to do the draws right after the questions, so make sure you get your, uh, your name in, in the draw. <coughs> Hi Tim, um, amazing array of ideas up there today, but I was really mostly intrigued by the very first slide you showed, um, which showed the creation of the Transportation Authority, and I had kind of a two-part question about that. Yeah. One, how much is under the authority of that transportation authority are the bridges and state highways and, and things like that, that that really affect the transportation in the city? Do, do you also have control over that? And two, how much of this do you think you would have achieved under the previous structure without that transportation authority? Okay. So this is my personal opinion. The first is factual, the second one is personal opinion. Okay? So, um, we don't control the bridges that come into San Francisco or the freeway network, but we work very close with the Department of Transportation, which is the, 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 like your provincial government. We work very close with them. Um, because we're so compact, we're in each other's hair all the time, so it's impossible for someone to come up with an idea and not tell us about it, because we've got all these eyes on the street. <laughs> We have, uh, we basically run all the separate streets in the city, the transit network, the taxis, and we have the traffic uh, police uh, detail in, in our agency. We don't have the, um, the, the highways and the bridges, but those organizations work very closely with us. Uh, I've noticed this lately, every time there's a meeting that they forgot to tell us about, some of just forgot to include the MTA, an email comes and says, did you know there was a meeting about this without you guys there? And so we have a lot of eyes, eyes and ears on the street now and um, the, literally seconds later an apology email comes and says, we, over, we completely forgot, we're so sorry. So um, on your second question, I don't believe we would have got to where we were um, had we not had the uh, three-pronged the three approach, which was in, uh, really strong elected leadership to push this forward. The advocacy from the civic leaders, this is not just the bike advocates or the trans advocates, these were civic leaders, business leaders, and internal staff champions who are ready to take that window opportunity. Um, many cities I've seen have two out of those three, or one out of those three, and things kind of flop. So you've got to grab, grab those two opportunities with internal champions and just go for it, because you have a very short window. And we probably wouldn't have done as much as we have done the last four years have we not had those three things in place because the previous six years we didn't have those three things in place even though we had the structure does that help answer your question okay uh question yes thank you Pam. uh thank you for your comments very insightful um and i'm a big I'm sorry my name is peter Lund. i'm a big fan of car share but i'm also a big fan of multi-mode transportation you have, in order to get from point a to point b it has to be efficient quick and it has to be it's the only option you have is multi-mode. I'm a big fan of public bikes as well, so I'm glad to see you mention that. One of the challenges we have here in Halifax, which I see in the summer of San Francisco, is Halifax is an old city and the streets are really narrow. And there's so many uh, competing interests, you know, cars parking in front of businesses, you know, then you get bikes, and we often see slides where you have bike lanes, and then you have that crosshatch between bike lane and car. 
which we don't have in your class because there's no room, and then you're competing with buses and cars. So I assume you had the same challenges in San Francisco. So I'm just wondering if you have any insightful suggestions on how to deal with that uh, with that aspect. Thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll say the same thing I said to our project manager: is prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. Which streets for what, and try it out. You know, try out a street to prioritize bicycles. Try out a street to prioritize transit, and just see what happens. You can't fit everything on one street, it's not possible in these narrow situations. So what gives? And if you have a city policy like we do that says transit first, we make sure the trend is protected always, and then we also protect bicycles as well. So if there's anything left for cars, that's residual for us for these, for these key streets. So it really is about focusing on, our, on your priorities and actually designing it for those priorities. Okay, where's Suzanne from Lindenberg? Is she still here? Oh, there you are. If you wanted to ask a question, you drove all the way from Lindenberg, so um, it was about rural, <coughs> urban, wasn't it? And yes. Oh. Okay. Just outside voice. Well, I'm I'm just concerned because um, I live about an hour's drive yeah. from the city. My husband was a commuter for a long time. Um, it's getting very expensive to commute, mm -hmm. um, but people um, need to stay in the area because a spouse may work in that area. They can't sell their homes now to move into the metro area. So I'm really concerned about efficient ways of moving people. We have a large number of commuters. We do have carpools and they are working, but still I see so many people in their own car traveling to the city. Um, I know there is a, a, a car park outside in Pantalan area that a lot of people are using. But once you get people to the city, how do we get them around the city to their workplaces? Right. Yeah, I mean, you, you raise a, this is a classic situation with many, it's not just urban and rural, it's, it's just suburban. Any, anything that's different from two points of, of, of the destination. And the really, the, you really have three options. So the, a really good ride sharing option, like a van share, you know, even carpoolers, it's really difficult because your schedules don't work sometimes. Something happens, kids got a cold, you're going to run out really quickly, and that person's lost their ride home. So van pooling <coughs> is more effective because it's not public transit per se, and it's not carpooling, it's something in between that's a little more flexible, and that, uh, you know, in traditional centres like we have in San Francisco and Halifax, we have outlying areas, and people are going to come into the city for work or whatever it is. It's actually really good to have these shuttle type van pool programs around those areas that come in so that you don't have to drive. But in the downtown, there'd be enough of them that if your schedule quickly changed, there's one that you can take back as well. So that's something that you know needs a bit of coordination to make it work, but it seems like there's enough from, from, from your area that that's definitely an option you could think about. The other thing is as well is to figure out ways of do you have to actually come into work? here. Is there a way that you can work from home at least one or two days a week just to lessen that stress of being on that on that road? And three, do you have to come in at 8.30? Everybody has to come to work at 8.30, right? Can you come in at 10? Can you come in at 11 or 6 or 4? You know, so what, what's the best way, or well not at all, right? But what's the, what's the best way that you can do that so not everybody has to be at downtown at 8.30 in the morning waiting in line to get that, to that car parking spot? Because it's very difficult to serve your community by transit if there's not enough of an of a intense uh, con uh, concentration of, of people. So van pooling and, and van sharing is really the, the in-between point because you don't want to come to work every day exhausted and frustrated. You want to you work, right? So if somebody else is driving for you, that's, that's great. Okay. And then that's really the opportunity. We have two more questions. Hi, uh, I'm David Wimberly. I'm with Transition Bay St. Margaret's part of the International Transition Move, which I know is really big in San Francisco. And we're out in St. Margaret's Bay, which is halfway between where the previous caller was talking about. And our active, our transportation group is really looking at extending uh, ride shares, including in sort of ways of making it almost like hitchhiking. Uh, and do you have a toolkit of things that can help with this or exploring options? Um, and can you talk more specifically about the ride share? Because we yeah. have so much area in Nova Scotia where uh, the existing bus lines are shutting down. 
much less being able to do it. And it means that the kids, uh, you know, my son can't live in my house anymore right. because there's no way he can connect with the city. Right. Uh, uh, big questions like that. Yeah, we have this um, program called Casual Carpool. And Casual Carpool is basically at the bridge point. So that's where everybody funnels in. So we have these almost like parking signs, but it says casual carpool rather than two hour parking. And you just wave at the curb and people drive by, open their doors, hop in, go over to the downtown and go. Same thing coming back as well. So you don't have to pay, because across the bridge is $6 in the peak period right now. And to take bar, which is the rail underneath, is about $3.50 or $4. But you can all ride basically for free together if someone's willing to drive backwards and forwards. So we call that casual carpooling. In DC, they're called slugging, where they just have five people wait and a car picks them up. So um, that's been modeled in many rural areas um, off, that, off that system. I think Vermont has, does it as well. Because there's finite corridors, there's concentrations of people at key points, whether it's uh, ferry terminals or bridge points. And it works really well that way. So that's something that you can guys think about. A lot of it comes down to trust. And so if you're not comfortable with that, uh, you know, Nova Scotians seem very friendly, so it's really fine. Um, California, eh, not so much. So we're gonna, <laughs> you've got to really think about it. But um, you know, it comes down to the drivers. And there's enough of them coming that you can you know, get in and out. And they have these social rules. No perfume, no radio, no chit chat. So you know you've got to think about all those things. But there's uh, actually now social media apps that have ride ride sharing matches, and, and the kids are always ride sharing right now with each other to get from campuses to elsewhere. So they're already starting to do this sort of stuff. One more question. Hi, Tim. My name is Julia. I work for the provincial Department of Energy on Sustainable Transportation. In the beginning of your presentation, you said. You know, the government can do some, but it can't do it by itself. And I'm going to ask you a question, but I first actually just want to acknowledge Pam Cooley, the president of CarShare, who's really put a lot of effort into bringing you here and holding several events and bringing stakeholders together. It's not just for an interest, but it's really um, trying to start a bigger conversation for the benefit of Halifax. So, can we just <laughs> And thank you, too, for coming. Uh, so we're developing a sustainable transportation strategy, and one part of that is community engagement. We've been talking about social marketing, and we know that we need to engage in the behavior change campaign, but I don't think we really have a clue how to do it yet. Do you have any recommendations? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. There's plenty more done before. Um, one of the cool things the kids are doing now is called crowdsourcing. And so what you basically say is you, um, you know, put up on your website, this intersection needs X, Y, and Z fixtures. What do you guys think? And everybody basically texts in and says, I want this done at this intersection. And it shows up how many people have actually responded to that intersection. And you can see where the demand is for these sort of things. For social marketing, for engagement, you can do the same thing because not everybody can come to that 6.30 meeting. And you're not listening to all the voices in the city. In fact, you're listening to very targeted, almost self-interested voices that come in and they kind of sway the conversation sometimes. So you can use social media to make Facebook or any of those other sites just as valid input modes as the person who physically came and yelled or waved at you, you know, depending on what it is. And they're the things that we, we work on, but I can, I can definitely help with those things. Um, that's no problem at all. The last thing I want to say about, your, about the energy piece, um, which I forgot to mention was, we actually collect all of the cooking oil in San Francisco restaurants and we use that to power our buses. And that was an idea that came from the Restaurant Association because they didn't want to deal with the grease anymore because it was just too hard. And with biofuel, with the sustainable transport strategy, that's something to think about is can you recycle that grease from restaurants and put it into your buses or into your diesel vehicles? It's something that you can think about. It's actually really, really the way to close that loop. So, you know, we should talk after and, and, and get that going. So I think we're, we're wrapping up for questions. So thank you again for coming. Um, spread the word. Um, I always say if you really, really like car share, spread the word. And if you don't like it, come to me. I'll fix it. <laughs> so um, it was cake and coffee and tea and outside. Um, 
to help celebrate us. Talk to each other, do community, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.